Okay, today we're in the book of Mark, chapter 5, and we're going to talk about crossing the line, because we're going to look at the story of the Gerasen demoniac and how Jesus heals him, but we're going to look at not just his reaction to the healing, but also the herdsman and the crowd's reaction. There's really a lot in these 20 verses, and the question I want to start with is, is there a line you won't let Jesus cross? Maybe you say, well, I'll follow Jesus as long as it doesn't cost me too much, or as long as I don't have to give up my entertainment choices, or as long as I don't look too weird or too extreme in the prevailing culture. See, today we're going to study a powerful healing that elicited two polar opposite reactions. One was awe-filled worship from the guy who gets healed, and then the other reaction was fright-filled rejection because of what it would cost them to follow Jesus. And really, Jesus has always had this kind of impact on the world. You either love him or you hate him. So let's get into our story for today. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the other side of the lake after the miracle that we saw last week. And it was in the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover today, so we'll be highlighting some of the text as we make sense of it. And the first thing I want to show you is this word here, the burial caves. I mean, think about that. This is where this demoniac was living, and it reminds us of this passage in Ephesians chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So most of us probably can't relate to demon possession, but when we think about Ephesians chapter 2, we have to recognize that really any kind of sin, and we all have sin, any kind of sin is from the devil, the commander of the demons, and therefore we've all lived in burial caves before. Back to the text, verses 4 and 5. Whenever this guy was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. But then Jesus shows up, verse 6. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Now, two things I want you to pay attention to here, and it's really man versus this demon. The man on the one hand, and the evil spirit that possessed him on the other hand. Notice the man was excited to meet Jesus. He ran to him, he bowed to him, but then the demon inside of him shrieks and screams and accuses Jesus and freaks out. And Jesus was certainly aware of this struggle within the guy. He demanded, what is your name? And the evil spirit replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. And then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. Now, all of this really makes me think about Romans chapter 7. That's where the apostle Paul talks about that battle within all of us. He says there, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I've discovered this principle in life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. So once again, while most of us can't relate to being demon-possessed, we can all relate to this passage right here. We can all understand understand this battle that goes on within each one of us, this battle between the Spirit's work in our life and the old sinful nature that's trying to drag us back into our old sinful habits. And I love what Paul says here at the end of this passage in Romans 7, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Here's the answer, verse 25, thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's exactly what we see as we return to the story in Mark chapter 5. It says there that there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. And so Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. 
what a vibrant picture of the deliverance that we can have because of Jesus. And I really want to point out this part in this little passage that Jesus gave them permission. We need to remember that Jesus is stronger than the enemy. Jesus is stronger than demons, and Jesus is stronger than Satan. It's not a fair fight. Jesus has authority over all things, even Satan and the demons. Now let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2 to see how Paul says it there. He says, God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. This is a picture of the kind of deliverance that we can all have through Jesus Christ. You know, we're all dead in our sins, but when we turn to Jesus in faith, the Bible says that in an instant, we're delivered over from death to life. Now, back to Mark chapter 5, because the story isn't over, we still have to look at these two different responses. It says the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who'd been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Now, I want to point out something you might have missed in the reaction here. First of all, it says that the herdsmen fled. It doesn't say that they ran off excitedly. No, they fled like they were running away from something that was terrifying to them. In fact, the crowd that gathered saw the man and they were all afraid. Now that's crazy because the man was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. For most of us, it was the demoniac who would have scared us, not a fully clothed and perfectly sane man. And we get more of the same in the next two verses. It says, Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And this is crazy, verse 17. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. And this is why I asked the question at the beginning, is there a line you won't let Jesus cross? See, apparently Jesus had crossed a line in that town that day that the people were not okay with. And it probably had to do with the economy of the time. 2,000 pigs had just jumped off a cliff to their death. And while we read that story today and think about how awesome that must have been, the herdsmen and even the crowd began to calculate the cost of following Jesus. After all, watching someone else struggle with demon possession might be scary, but it doesn't probably cost you anything. But if Jesus were to go around that town and continue performing miracles like this, it could hit the people where it hurt them most, that is in their pocketbooks. So Jesus crossed the line, the people were afraid that he might do it again, and so they begged him to leave. And here's the crazy thing, he did. It says as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. And so the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. And those are the two polar opposite reactions to this incredible miracle of Jesus on this day awe-filled worship from this guy right here, and he runs off to tell people about the great things Jesus did, and fright-filled rejection from the other group who also ran off to tell people, but not in a good way. They warned people about Jesus and what it would cost if you followed him. And even today, some people refuse to see the good that Jesus wants to do in the world. Their minds are made up, they reject him at every turn, whatever their motive, financial, political, relational, emotional. They're determined to fight against Jesus, his teachings, and even his followers. These people were around in Jesus's day, and they're still here today.